Okay. <laughs> yes. Dear friends, I am very sorry, but I have to interrupt our wonderful talks because our session is starting. Well, good morning. Yeah. Good morning to all who are following us online. It's very nice that you are still with us wherever you would be. And today's topic of our discussion is very important, not because it moves us from the theoretical mm, reflections on what does it mean to love Israel, but to the very painful and very challenging issues of mercy and justice especially actual this time, now when the world is teared apart by wars and one of them, the most irrational, the most stupid and uh, war takes part at that territories from where many of our ancestry came. Um, before we will start our talk, before uh, mm, we will discuss this issue, I'd like to remind just three points. The first is linguistic. As all of us know, mercy, a word mercy, in, Yiddish, in Hebrew, sorry, in Hebrew, he has two translations. One is Rachmones. And it is not by accident that during Yom Kippur, people pray El Malach Rachmonim. Rachmonis is an unconditional mercy. That mercy that, that mercy, that love that comes from the womb, absolutely irrational when we are speaking about uh, our elite, uh, mainly Western understanding, what does it mean to be merciful? The second word, chesed, is a practice of unconditional mercy. Mm, maybe it would be said that the whole scripture is a book of chesed, is a handbook of chesed, of chesed of God to humans and of chesed of humans uh, to each other in, sometimes in very strange, in very unexpected situation. situations. Sorry. Uh, the second point I would like to emphasize now is just a quote from Isaiah. Do right, seek justice, depend the oppressed. And we remember well that in commandments, the necessity to be just, the necessity to be hospitable is directly connected not with the high qualities of the nation. Nation has, uh, I would say na nation has various qualities, not only the best one, but it directly connects with the memory of the own oppression with the memory of the own persecutions because you were slaves. Uh, aha, love to Israel practiced in mercy is directly connected with the honest memory about our own history. And the third are words of the Holocaust survivor 
one of the last defenders of Warsaw Ghetto, Marek Edelman. When Marek was asked, what does it mean for you to be a Jew? He answered, for me to be a Jew means to be with most persecuted, means to be with most weak, stand for those who are outcasts in our well-to-do society. And uh, let's keep in mind these points when we will reflect on the presentations of our participants. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first of them, Lee Spitzer, who is Baptist pastor, Jewish Baptist pastor, denominational leader, consultant and historian, who for the past two decades, he has resided in Bordentown, New Jersey, USA. In retirement, Lee serves as a historian of the Baptist World Alliance, affiliated, affiliate professor for Northern Seminary and research fellow for the International Baptist Studies Center in Amsterdam. He serves as an assistant moderator and the treasurer of Yihad B. Yeshua. Lee, thank, thank you in advance for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. And I'd also like to say good morning to the some 36 or more participants who are joining us via Zoom. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this morning. It has been a great conference, and I hope today will uh, match up to the quality of yesterday that we had here. My presentation is going to be called Walking with God and the Jewish People. My Jewish childhood as a boy was dominated by the probing and conflicted questions of the Haftarah passage for this week. It comes out of Micah chapter six, verses six through eight. With what shall I come before Adonai and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Adonai be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? As a youthful perfectionist with a spiritually tender soul that desperately desired to connect with and please the almighty God of Israel, I was taunted by the existentially demanding behavioral gap between the actuality of my imperfect participation in the Mosaic Covenant and the vision that I had even as a child of fulfilling chesed and its ideal of covenant faithfulness. I was all too aware of, quote, the sin of my soul, as Micah says, which I understood to represent a personal failure to live out all of the Mosaic commandments according to the standards of the Almighty, as well as a communal failure of my people to reconcile Israel's spotty and quite imperfect response to the spiritual implications of the covenant's judgment, which led to exile many times, when we as a people fall short of the ideal of chesed. This all called into question for me personally as a child, my standing before God and what I considered to be the justice and mercy of the covenant itself. Nevertheless, without any connection to any local synagogue as a child, I grew up with a never wavering self-identification as a Jew. This Jewish identity was comprehensive, including a commitment and love for the nation of Israel as the home for the Jewish people. And I would add that it was only later that I really became sensitive to the resulting plight of the Palestinians, which, of course, is a key issue today. A clear sense that as an American Jew, I was never and would never be a Gentile. I had a deep commitment to what I saw of Jewish cuisine. My grandmother made the best pot roast and kashavanichkas you ever tasted until my wife came along. 
the acceptance of certain Jewish American cultural values, such as the love of education and books. My wife is not afraid I would ever run away with another woman, but with a library. This love for books inevitably led me to the Jewish scriptures as a child, which in turn gave me inspiration and spiritual nourishment as I considered the journeys of Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, and especially Ezekiel, my connection to the prophetic tradition of Judaism and of Israel began in those formative years. Everything came to a climax when I was 14 years old. Through an unexpected mystical encounter with God's divine presence and voice, I discovered that Jesus was both Jewish and the Messiah who entered into human history, quote, to save his people from their sins, Matthew 121. For 52 years now, I, along with my dear wife Lois, who is also Jewish, have sought to be faithful as Jewish disciples of Jesus to our calling in answer to Micah's final question, and what does Adonai require of you? And so I come today wishing to answer, at least in part, that question of what does God require of us as Jewish followers of the Messiah? What are we to do in response to chesed? And how do we express love for Israel in the process? My interpretation, coming from the background that has guided my journey throughout all these years, has been inspired by Micah's solution to that question. He says, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, if I were playing Baptist preacher this morning, which I am not because I'm now retired, I would see a perfect three-part sermon because to be an American Baptist preacher, you have an intro, which you've heard, a three-part sermon and a conclusion, and you've done very well if you keep the talk under three hours. But I would like to suggest to you that as often happens when we consider the Jewish worldview, what we do not do is split hairs with these three um, commands, but rather to put them together in a synergistic way and see how they speak to our heart and soul as Jewish disciples of Jesus. The first phrase to act justly is pretty straightforward. It certainly means to love Israel and all around us as people who have been made in the image of God and that our social context requires that we not cheat people, that we serve them rather than take advantage of them, that we look for justice and righteousness in how we construct our very community. The second phrase to walk humbly with God, the third phrase to walk humbly with God is also fairly straightforward, but I have a twist to it. The word walk in the Jewish scriptures is often a synonym for to journey. It is the most common metaphor for describing the course, phases, and stages of spiritual life. And so I interpret it as saying that the answer is to walk in covenantal faithfulness. And that is reinforced by the middle phrase, to love mercy, ahavat chesed. And chesed has been my favorite word for my entire Christian Jewish walk. Because though it is simply translated mercy and it can be reduced to that, like so many Hebrew words like shalom, it's got 400 different meanings depending on the context. And from a theological point of view, I would suggest that hechid, hechid, hesed, sorry, is always bound up in an understanding of our covenantal relationship with God and those who are called by God. In this case, we're talking about Israel, but I would also extend it to those in the church as well. So then the question for me becomes out of Micah, how do we as Jewish disciples of Jesus live in such a way towards Israel that we promote justice, that we promote covenant faithfulness, that we promote progress in the spiritual journey so that all those around us are influenced to get closer to God and not run further away from him? How do we enhance the spirituality and the covenantal life of our people whom we dearly love and identify with? 
And even though this is not a Baptist sermon, I still got to come back to three points. Forgive me for it. It's just ingrained in me now. The first point I'd like to make based on the three phrases we've looked at is that God invites Jewish disciples of Jesus to journey into an identification with Israel. Now, there are many ways to do it. And in this uh, talk, I'm talking more personally than um, theologically, if you wish. And I would like to suggest to you that there are many ways to do it. But for me, the way this has worked out is through, for example, two points I would make. The first is I retired on January 1st, 2020, from 45 years of pastoral ministry in the Baptist world. On that same day, the new Daf Yomi Talmud study cycle began across the Jewish world. And since it's an international uh, community, it's all done through the internet. And it had always been on my bucket list to read the Talmud, not in little pieces, not the highlights. I wanted to study it like I had always done with the Tanakh and with the apostolic writings of the New Testament, cover to cover unvarnished. And here was my opportunity. It's going to take seven and a half years. I'm halfway through that spiritual journey now. And, and I must tell you, that it has been very enlightening and interesting. There are about two dozen of my friends around the world who I'm sharing snippets of the Talmud with, the, ones, the passages I consider most interesting. And um, this is not the place for me to give a critique of the Talmud. I won't do that. But I would suggest that studies such as Daf Yomi done alongside our Jewish sisters and brothers around the world is a great way of saying, I love Israel and identify with it. And at the same time, immersing yourself in, in the rabbinic tradition that is not so emphasized, say, in my context, but would be, for example, in the Messianic context. And so it's been very good educationally. But I would suggest more profoundly, and I mean that for me personally, has been my launching for the last 20 years into genealogical research. Genealogy, by the way, according to many Jewish writers, is a form of modern religious spiritual discipline and, and is often treated religiously. If you're involved in Jewish genealogical groups, oh my gosh, they have denominations just like we do in the religious world. It's crazy. But through that, I went from only knowing about three dozen of mine and Lois's relatives, because when we became followers of Yeshua, in our teenage years, our extended families abandoned us. Now, in my database, I have 5,300 relatives. Most of them have passed, and Lois says, I seem to like dead people much better than living relatives. But the fact is, I've also met, and Lois, relatives, cousins, uh, great aunts, etc., who have now been willing, after all these decades, to relate to us and act like family. So I'm actually getting to express my love for the Jewish people through real relationships with my family, but there's more. Through my genealogical research, I was able to discover that my great-grandfather, Laid, who am I, I'm named after, that's where I get the name Lee from, was considered, according to family tradition, to be a very mystical Jewish man, a chassid. Um, who had a dream or a vision back around 1900 where God warned him to get his family out of Eastern Europe because of pogroms to come. And so they walked across Northern Europe, got on boats in places like Hamburg and Bremen, ended up in the Lower East Side of New York. And because of that, I am alive today. But it turns out that something happened through the generations of our family's history. He was very religious and very mystical. The next generation, his children, were religious, but not mystical. The third generation, the generation of my mom, were neither religious nor mystical. And then comes the fourth generation, me. And I have, as you've already heard just briefly in my story, the mystical spirit of my great-grandfather, whom I'm named after, 
has been part of my spiritual journey since the very beginnings of my childhood. And so literally, the signification of the name is as accurate as any of those biblical designations you see where people in Genesis get a name and it turns out to mean something you can preach on. For me, my identification with the Jewish people has now become one through time. It's a journey through time with the Jewish people. And my great grandfather and I, I can't wait to meet him in the life to come to compare notes and to see if in fact my perception of the gift he gave to me is how he would in fact see it, et cetera. The second journey is a journey to the land. It was my wish uh, as a Jew to, to visit Israel. And I had decided once I be, ended up in the Gentile church that I would never go on one of those Christian eight day pilgrimages where you see phony Christian sites commemorating things in places where they didn't happen. I, I remember being taken to a room that was supposedly where Jesus did the last supper and the building was built in the 12th century. Now that's a miracle, that's a miracle. I wanted to go to Israel to live there. To, to be a wandering Jew in my home. And so through the grace of God, about 20 years ago, I was given a sabbatical grant by an organization. And I lived four months in Israel all by myself, taking classes at Hebrew University. But this was the summer of the Intifada, where terrorist bombs were going off everywhere. And I was, I was in Tel Aviv when the bomb went off at the nightclub. I lived in Jerusalem when the bomb went off at the Sparrow Pizza Place, where I used to sit two or three times every week and watch the mothers with their children. That one day, I happened to be out of the city when the bombing took place, or else I would have been in that bombing. And the four months that I essentially got to wander through the Holy Land was a remarkable pilgrimage and spiritual experience for me something that no little week tour could have ever done. And it made me feel in a very deep way that I was home. And in fact, some places, which accorded to some of the mystical experiences I had, really, when I went there and actually went to the place that were in my dreams or visions, turned out to have a sense of the presence of God I, I can't even describe. It was so remarkable. And the stories there are really cool. Thirdly, I would suggest to you, that God through Micah calls us into a journey of prophetic service and witness. This is the mishpat part of the text that I've left for last because I may need to run after I talk to you about this because I may offend some of you, but that's certainly not mean or intentional. It's just that to be prophetic sometimes means to make us ponder. And I've always been a student and a lover of the prophetic tradition of our faith. From Isaiah and Ezekiel, he especially in exile, all the way down to people like Abraham Joshua Heschel of our own time. And I would like to suggest to you that there are some ways that Yechad be Yeshua can certainly participate in that prophetic journey. First, I would suggest we need to make every connection we possibly can between us and non-Messianic, non-Yeshua uh, following parts of our Jewish community. I find this to be particularly hard because all throughout my journey, I have, dis I have had amazing experiences with our wider family and deep hurt and rejection. But is that any different than what we see in the life of Jesus where rejection is part of the very pinnacle and apex of his Messianic experience? Um, rejection from others is part of the great theme of Israel. So it should not be surprising that Jewish disciples of Yeshua should have to regularly experience that theme in and through our journeys. So I would suggest no many time, no many, how many times we get rejected, we should keep trying to be, build bridges with our family, with our friends, with others in, who are part of the Jewish community, but not yet followers of Yeshua. Secondly, and this is, this is really the hard part, God calls us as Jewish followers of Jesus 
to be aware of the social, political, economic realities and struggles and challenges of our time. We cannot allow our spiritual devotion to blind us to the fact that much of what's happening in our world does not please God. We need to think hard and creatively about how we can have an impact in our world and in our communities and in our families to promote mishpat, social justice in a way that is real and authentic. I'll give you a very hard one, for example, just as a question, I have no answer. Take the question of reparations. We Jewish people are ecstatic that for decades, Germany, in remorse for what Hitler and the Nazis did during the Holocaust period, provide reparations to Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. I'm certainly in favor of that. No amount of money could ever make up for the suffering and loss, but it's an actual practical way, reparations, of expressing society-wide, national-wide, international-wide remorse. In the same way, the United States provided reparations for the Japanese community who were unfairly interned by us. Well, us, the people from the United States. Canada was not involved in that, as far as I know. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but that was something we did very quickly and very quietly, by the way. We didn't want to make our remorse too public, but we did it. In Canada, I was going to bring up, I am incredibly impressed by the Canadian emphasis on how to work with First Nations peoples. Canada is far ahead of the United States and other countries dealing with Indigenous people. And in fact, the Baptist World Alliance will recognize that a week from now in our meetings in, Nor in Norway, where we vote a resolution on this subject. Why do I bring it up? Well, in the Western world, for centuries, we benefited from slavery. And our African American friends suffered terribly in ways that in the African American spiritual community are likened to the Exodus, one of their formative stories of spirituality and the Holocaust as well. Why are we today in the 21st century still not ending what we started, at least in the United States in the Civil War, of bringing freedom and justice to those from Africa who were brought against their will and their descendants here in our world? I don't have an answer on how quite to do that justly, but I would suggest to you for the last few years, this has been heavy on my heart as a Jew, that if I wanted Germany to do it for our people, don't we have a responsibility? Don't Jews always feel a responsibility for others outside our family? On a more unifying note, perhaps, because that may scare some of you. Uh, by the way, I'm not taking an offering for reparations or anything today. Don't worry, relax. There is one overly transcendent issue that Yechad Yeshua must be prophetic on. It's vital to our expressing love for Israel. And that's opposing all and every form of anti-Semitism that exists in the 21st century. Who would have thought that anti-Semitism would be more prevalent across the globe today than it was in 1944 or 45? Who would have thought across the world we would have to deal with prejudice and hate, like is being manifested, at least in my world, on almost a daily basis across the United States. But it's happening all across Europe, all across Asia, et cetera, the Muslim world. Yechad Yeshua, as the people of God who live in the body of the Messiah, as well as among the people of Israel, have a unique place and platform to say one cannot be a Christian, Gentile or Jewish, and be anti-Semitic in any way, shape, or form. I've devoted my whole ministry to that one sentence. And also communicate to Israel that we as Jewish followers of Jesus stand 100% with them when anti-Semitism arises. 
I close with one quick story, if I may. In World War II, there was a community of Jewish Baptists in Poland. They were, they were known. They were well accepted by the Baptist community. And when Hitler began rounding up all the Jews throughout Poland, the Baptist leadership, the Gentile Baptist leadership said to these people, we can save you. We'll give you baptismal certificates, which they already had. They were baptized as adults. Right? They had all that. They were church members. We will vouch for you. We will protect you. And in response, the small group of Jewish believers said, no. How can we say to our family that we follow Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, and let you go by yourselves to the camp and die? How can we abandon you? And so they voluntarily went to the camps with their families to suffer their same fate as a way of authenticating that their covenant faithfulness, their way of living out chesed, would be something they could validate in the most extreme way. I am so humbled by that. When Micah says, walk humbly with your God, I've never been called to sacrifice for my people that way, and yet they did it. Nobody, by the way, in the Baptist world knows the story. It was hidden. Uh, I only discovered it a few years ago in an archive. But it speaks to me. Yechad Yeshua. We can be the ones who walk with our Lord and witness love to our people sacrificially and thus fulfill Micah's dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Lee. Thank you for your last uh, story. You know, it was not a unique story about Shaw in Poland as well as in Lithuania. I know at least three of the similar stories from the Roman Catholic context when that part of the family that was baptized in the Catholic Church, consciously baptized, denied to hide uh, just because they did not want to be separated from the destiny of their bigger family and of their bigger nation, uh, there is a lot of, of things to discuss. There is uh, a lot of things to be thankful for. I hope we will have some time after the presentations. And now um, I'm very glad to invite brother Gilbert Joseph Bloomer, who is a Hebrew Catholic and consecrated brother, or a little monk, Monacello, who lives in Dover in Tanzania. He is a moderator. Oh, Tasmania, sorry, Tasmania. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> he, he is the moderator and the littlest brother of the little Eucharistic brothers of Divine Will, which is a public association of Christ's faithful in the Archdiocese of Hobart and the coordinator of the Bni Miriam Havura. Thank you, Father Gilbert, or Brother Gilbert. Am I here? Yes. Can you see me? Hello? Hello? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. Oh, good. It's just my computer's a bit dodgy. Okay, yes, I'm not from Tanzania. I'm from Tasmania. I live in a small fishing village, well, outside the village, actually, five kilometres on a 21-acre property in which we have... Um, Besides the brothers, we have six uh, cows. So 
that's my location. Um, <clears throat> can someone let me know when I've reached my 10 minutes? Because I cannot see a clock from here. Uh, so this topic uh, interests me, and Lee yeah, quoted from Micah, um, I think it's chapter 8, verse 6 or 6, 8, I can't remember which way, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that has a deep significance to me because I belonged for many years and lived in a community that worked with street kids, drug addicts, prostitutes, etc., cetera, uh, on, on the streets of uh, Melbourne and also in Perth at different times, uh, that that was their motto to their work. Now, this term, Ahavat Yisrael, I think uh, has to go within the context of our discussion on justice and mercy um, uh, with the word tikkun and tikkun olam. So tikkun olam, as you probably all know, is the repair of the world or tikkun reparation, as, uh, as Catholics tend to call it. And I think those two go together. And in that context of uh, repairing the world and tikkun olam, and having this Ahavat Israel, there's two important uh, principles uh, that I think go with that, which is what we can do in a practical as well as a spiritual way, is solidarity and support. And when I was uh, younger, I came from a family who were, um, my grandparents, none of them were religious at all. And my mother in 1959 became a believer in Yeshua uh, when Billy Graham came to Australia. And through his preaching, my mother and aunt only went out of curiosity because everybody else was going. And they found faith in Yeshua then. And uh, later on, my father, who was an atheist, he um, became a believer as well when I was seven years old uh, uh, through uh, wanting to prove my mother wrong. And so he decided to read the Bible. And by the time he finished reading the Bible, he decided he would be baptised with me so, and my two, uh, two uh, younger brothers. So we were baptised, in that was in 1970, and we belonged to a um, group. We were Evangelical Anglicans, and we belonged to another group known as Jewish Evangelical Witness. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Its leader was a guy called, who, who went to America, whose name was um, uh, Lawrence Duff Forbes. Some of you may have heard of him. And he was one of the first ones to use the term in America of Messianic Jews rather than the traditional Hebrew Christian. So I grew up in that. I was, uh, you know, indoctrinated <laughs> in love of uh, the Jews coming back to Israel in fulfilment of the prophecies. However, when I got to my teenage years, I started to explore other beliefs as one does at that stage. And I became interested in things like the occult and I started to study that. I never got into the dark side of that. I just was more intellectual reading and studying. Uh, I had a grandmother, a step-grandmother who was Russian, who was also interested in that. So I would have a lot of discussions with her. At that time, I bought into, um, I could say, instead of having a Havat Israel, I had hatred of Israel. I had hatred towards uh, Zionism, political Zionism, even though I'd been brought up uh, to uh, like religious Zionism. And I, came, I had a hatred of religious Judaism, which I thought was evil. And uh, I wouldn't have called myself anti-Semitic. I wouldn't have even call myself anti-Jewish. But looking back, I would say I became anti-Semitic and I became anti-Jewish. Uh, as a result of thinking that the Jewish people were in a conspiracy to take over the world by the wealthy Jewish bankers and the Zionists, the political Zionists working together. And so I also believe that part of that plot was the Catholic Church, who was in league with the, um, uh, with the Freemasons uh, as well. So the Vatican, the Freemasons and the Jews were all in a plot together to take over the world. And I know by experience how deadly that poison can be, because here's me coming from a Jewish family who has bought into it. And um, anyway, I won't go on, on that tangent because that's not what we're talking about. But I do see this importance of what Lee was talking about, about these lies of anti-Semitism. 
praise God, when I was about 17 or 18 at university, my first year, um, I had an experience of God in the Holy Spirit. And it was the first time I ever really experienced God and felt his love. And that transformed my heart. Overnight, I lost all my anti-Jewish or anti-Judaism feelings. I lost all my anti-Catholicism because I didn't actually hate Jewish people or hate Catholic people. I just hated their religions mainly, uh, Judaism and Catholicism. But overnight, even though I didn't agree with them through that experience necessarily, I lost my prejudice towards them and only felt love towards them. And so then I could look at them more objectively. And strangely enough, that experience led me to become eventually a devout Orthodox Jew. I became an Orthodox Jew uh, in, the, in, um, in Melbourne, in, in the community in Melbourne. I had a very lovely holy rabbis that taught me. Uh, 10 rabbis came over from America, from New Jersey, um, and they started a, a kalel in Melbourne, which I attended and I, I learned and I was being instructed uh, by, by the rabbis. And so I can say I totally lost my um, feelings about Judaism, but I also realized what I'd been told what Judaism was about and what I'd been told what Catholicism about wasn't true. They were both caricatures, which I had as a child just bought into. And it, and it, and, uh, it, it takes many years of learning and education and reading to uh, fully um, I realized that, but I think without the spiritual experience, I wouldn't have got there. And then uh, when I was 24, I had an experience of um, the real presence of Jesus in a Catholic church that I went in just to look at in across from the Kalel. And um, I felt that experience there and I wanted to know uh, what that was about. So that led me to become a Catholic. So I won't go into any more details about that, just to say, that as someone who is in the Catholic Church, I entered the Catholic Church as an Orthodox Jew. When I converted, I converted through the Dean of the Cathedral. Um, I had a private mass with about 30 or 40 of my friends. And I was wearing kippah, zitzitz, talus. I never intended to give up my practice of the mitzvot in order to be a Catholic. And the dean didn't seem to have any problem with that. And so I became a Catholic and I considered, continued to observe the mitzvot. And uh, I still attended synagogue at times. And what amazed me was that <clears throat> the old men that I'd go to and we'd have a minion or something, that insist I get up and read some of the blessings on the, uh, on the Torah. And uh, I'd say to them, but I'm a, a Catholic now. And they'd say, Oh, that doesn't matter. A yid is a yid is a yid. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And so they accepted me. And so that's why I stress this idea of solidarity. I eventually, I lived in Israel a number of times. And, um, and I, in, in Israel, I, be, I became friends with a rabbi who worked with uh, the street people. And he used to pay me to be part of the Maccabean Institute, and they were ultra orthodox. And I was paid to teach um, uh, some of the ultra orthodox youth who had got in trouble uh, with violence and with the law. And so I did that. And uh, it was through him I then uh, uh, studied at the yeshiva, etc. I hope I haven't gone over time, have I? And uh, how many minutes have I got to go? I'm very sorry. I feel incredibly awkward, Brother Gilbert, but unfortunately, 10 minutes are... Oh, oh okay. So uh, can I just add one or two sentences and that'll be it. Uh, I am in a very good relationship with the rabbi here in Tasmania, and that is because I support the Jewish community financially. We tie their money, so I give to them financially to support them and I support his mission of promoting Yiddish kite in Tasmania because without him, the Jewish community would be dead. And I think if you come with solidarity and not there to evangelize and preach and do all those sort of things, you will can 
and you will build up a good relationship even with the Orthodox Jewish community, especially the Orthodox Jewish community, I think. And uh, when they realize that you're there to share with them and in the Jewish life and the Jewish mission and not, uh, not um, be there on your own agenda of trying to convert people to your beliefs. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I went too long. Uh, it's the uh, most horrible part of being moderator uh, to in, is to interrupt people at the most interesting point. Uh, thank you, Brother Gilbert. I hope uh, you will have a lot of questions because your talk is incredibly inspiring. And now I am very glad to invite Merti Salomon, who is a theologian, author, and podcaster from Cincinnati. Um, he's a, the president of Impact Campus Ministries and the creator of Bima Post Podcast, where he attempts to bring his Jewish heritage to bear on conversations about more historically informed readings of the Bible in the evangelical space. I too want to use uh, Micah 6 as my guide, and I, I'm no Baptist, but I couldn't help but notice the three points myself. Um, seems to be a fitting guide for my personal meditation on Ahava Israel in my own context, and my own context will be really important here. Um, I don't expect these reflections to be universal, but maybe there are some helpful things in there. My context is that of the Protestant evangelical world. My family had a ready awareness of our Jewish heritage as migrants from Western Europe in the 19th century. However, my parents had been influenced by a popular and widespread theology of displacement and replacement and the supersessionist assumption, Jesus came, so why would being Jewish matter? My world has always been that of evangelical fundamentalism, particularly, specifically in the American church and the non-denominational church growth movement. It, the joke is that in my household, Dr. James Dobson was the fourth member of the Trinity. But that gives you a sense of the world in which I was raised. In many ways, I feel like I've had two families, two overlapping identities that have uh, gave shape to my faith. Without getting into my story, this would provide the backdrop for what I have always felt is my clear calling and responsibility to steward as a Jewish believer. How can I help Gentile evangelicals have a deeper awareness of the historical Jewishness of their faith and help pastor them into a more compassionate engagement with the Jewish world? With so much damage having been done to Judaism under the banner of Christendom, standing resolutely, squarely, and faithfully in this space is simply a part of how I have sought to have love for my fellow Jew. To act justly, I have learned a lot about justice in the last decade or so. Lee touched on so much of this. A lot about power and abuse of power, the obvious relationships that this power has had with evangelicalism in the West and the resulting injustices. Issues of gender, race, wealth, and all sorts of exploitation have driven our missional methodologies. It seems at times in our treatment of people as mere commodities, our ability to hurt others has known few bounds. It just so happens that one of the groups that has suffered both now and for centuries prior is our fellow Jew. I have Orthodox Jewish friends and an unorthodox Jewish friend in Old City, Jerusalem, a non-believing Jew named Moshe Kempinski, who helped me reframe so much of what is missing in the Gentile Protestant evangelical church's relationship with Judaism. Moshe told me that the Western church has always been fascinated with abstract theology, often held in a vacuum. But I know my text, Moshe will say with a twinkle in his eye. He helped me fall in love with Isaiah 32. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. Each one will be a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. And then the eyes of those who have sight will not be closed, and the ears of those who have hearing will listen. The minds of the rash will have good judgment and the tongues of stammerers will speak readily and distinctly. There is obviously one glorious king, Messiah Jesus, but there are many rulers and it is these rulers, plural, you and I, that are called to be shelter and shade, a refuge from the storm, a stream of living water. It's when these rulers finally remember their call to Mishpat, to Zedekah, 
It is then, Isaiah says, that eyes will be opened. I don't mean that in a soteriological, saved, going to heaven sense. I mean in a reciprocal, receiving love, ahava sense. It's then that love will be felt. Or in the words of Moshe, I think Christians have been so enamored with Jesus fulfilling prophecy, they've forgotten that so much of God's plan revolves around the prophecy that they are meant to fulfill. If Jesus is the guy, then Mishpat will flow like a mighty river, Zadeka like a never-failing stream, and the mountains would drip with Ahavat Yisrael. And yet when God has come to the evangelical church looking for Zadeka, he has often found only Zadeka. And addressing this with my wild olive tree family is a part of how I pursue Ahavat Yisrael. To love mercy, I believe that in my context, I have to love mercy enough to seek it. I need to model to my Gentile neighbors the process of true repentance and not simply cheap confession. Again, it's my non-believing Jewish friends and instructors that have been the most helpful here. They have taught me about the process of tshuva during the high holidays. Tshuva has taught me how to press on beyond mere confession of my sins to realizing the impact of those sins. It has called me to name that destructive result and seek restitution and reparation whenever possible. It's called me even beyond this to actively seek to identify ways in which I can prevent repeating such past offenses. Ultimately, tshuva has called me to change my behavior, insisting that only then, when I've changed that behavior, is repentance something that has truly taken place. I need to love mercy. I need to love mercy because I need mercy. I need mercy from my fellow Jew. Seeking this mercy is something that we Jews do routinely, at least once every year. This is an act of worship and love between Jews, a corporate expression of ve'ahavta lereacha kamocha, between Benai Avraham. Seeking mercy, asking for forgiveness, being honest about how we've fallen short in Gentile, Protestant, often ignorant Christian world, is a part of how I want to practice Ahavat Yisrael. Finally, I can practice Ahavat Yisrael by continuing to learn, walking humbly, continuing to learn from my fellow Jew. You will notice how much of my reflection has been taught to me by my Jewish family, oftentimes non-believing Jewish family. As a Protestant who didn't find my place of worship within a larger Jewish community, I have to actively seek this out. I believe other Jews in similar context to myself should be diligent about this as well. I find it interesting that in Paul's letter to the Romans, in a section where he is calling a Gentile Jewish community to Ahava, he contends that we all learn from each other. His call is a call to humility. In Romans 15, 14 through 16, I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Paul speaks of this relationship between Jew and Gentile, and not one party having this obvious teaching leverage, but this humility to which both parties instruct the other. Part of me seeking to walk humbly is always remembering and truly believing that I could be wrong, that I could have done wrong, that I am in need of instruction. That humility is not just a gesture. It's an act of love. And as I reflect on humility, I, I think of how so often Christian or, or followers of Jesus, Jewish or Gentile, we always plant ourselves squarely with this, this belief that because Christ is in us, we have, a, we have a statement that we're coming from a place of truth. But it's also true that because Christ is in us, we come from a place of humility, of dying to self. I'm drawn to think and close about this passage from Philippians 2. And I think about Philippians 2 squarely in the middle of my call to Ahavat Yisrael. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, from Ahava, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And we know how the passage goes. I know I'm right on the edge of time. It is because of Christ's willingness to empty himself, to walk humbly. It is because of Christ's willingness to lose on behalf of others that he wins. That is why he is exalted. It's in his willingness to drop to the bottom that he is exalted. It is Christ's Ahava for all creation, 
that leads to ultimate reconciliation, love realized. As we consider Ahavat Yisrael, may we also be willing to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly as Jesus walked among his fellow Jews. Matthew, thank you so much for your powerful presentation. Thank you so much for your power, uh, powerful presentation and especially for the reminder that we need to love and to practice mercy just because all of us need mercy. And now I am very glad to invite our fourth presenter, Jordan Blanchard, who lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan. He works as a music therapist in the state prison with individuals suffering mental health related issues. He, is also, he also is engaged in the Messianic Jewish community. He leads a youth Bible study over Zoom for Messianic Jewish youth. And he is the small group coordinator for Yihad Be Yeshua. Welcome. Thanks, Elena. Uh, first, I just want to thank Mark for inviting me to be on this panel. It's it's very humbling and a little intimidating, but it's good. I'm happy to be here and happy to um, share my side of things. Yes, I certainly can. No, all of us. Is that better? All right. Um, <clears throat> so, I uh, my background is more in a non-denominational church type setting. Uh, I have a Jewish mother, a Christian father, a Gentile Christian father. And uh, my upbringing uh, was very rich as far as being instilled a very strong sense of my Jewish identity and the importance of it um, and certain practices, which certainly uh, ingrained it in a very real uh, uh, tangible sense. Um, that being said, I wasn't really part of a broader Jewish community outside of my family. Most holidays, you know, traditionally only Pesach is celebrated in the home. But in my family, all holidays were celebrated in the home, um, uh, with the exception of occasionally attending um, services. So um, that being said, though, even if I were to be a part of a Messianic congregation, it still does not mean, right, that I would be uh, growing up in the broader context of a broader Jewish community. So um for me and where I'm coming from, uh, inviting, being invited to speak on this topic, um, unfortunately, a lot of it comes to what do I think about it? And, uh, and I will include some things that I practically do and, and encourage people to practically do and I would like to do more of um, towards the end. But I want to start with some of my thoughts and where I've come to, uh, what I've come to think and uh, what, what kinds of things have encouraged me along the way. Um, so the first... Sure. Yeah, we can shit start. Oh, we lost it. Oh. We can start the video, right? Where's video? Unable to start it. Stop what I'm doing. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Is this part of my time? That's good. Great. Starting now. Yes, time to stop. Time to stop. Yes. Eschatological moment. Yeah. Time. Yes. Should I continue now? Are we back? I don't know. Are we back? We're good. Okay. Um. So the the first thing I I. So, to summarize it in a way, kind of everything that I'm going to say is to act at all is a challenge and a blessing. So, and the way I would emphasize that is to act at all <laughs> is a challenge and a blessing. I think of the language uh, when Moses gets very mad at God and is like, you know, you made it worse. You have not saved your people at all. I don't even see a, a, a little bit of what you've done. You know, um, certainly Moses needs to be patient. And so I think we have to realize to act at all, to, to actually do something at all is not easy. And, it, and because it's not easy, it is a blessing when we do it. 
Um, certainly we know it's a blessing when people do things for us. Um, <clears throat> and I find that uh, to be very interesting when I think about the word about justice and mercy, I was thinking about how just, justice requires time and energy and that mercy requires patience and restraint. And if you think of time, energy, patience, and restraint, none of those are easy things. And so uh, I think it's really easy to think, oh, yes, I love justice. I love mercy. Um, and these are my thoughts on it. Um, but uh, to understand and really step into, no, it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's going to be, you know, knowing more doesn't make it easier. Um, and I think that's something that I've been kind of coming to a realization of um, as I've been reflecting on this um, topic. Uh, a, a metaphor, I, it's a metaphor, but I've also experienced this. If you think of a soundboard technician, so sometimes you're at a concert and there's that soundboard with all the little knobs and, uh, you know, maybe the balance is off, right? The singer sounds too quiet or the, the guitar is too loud or whatever. Um, and if you see a soundboard technician looking at the board and it's going, oh, I wonder, I don't, you know, what should I, you know, nothing's happening. And, and if you just try something, let's see what this, you know, it, this was this do. Okay. You know, maybe it's not the right thing, but then you learn what that does. Okay. Let me move this. See what that does. Let me move this. So in my opinion, you know, of course we have the, the risk of acting wrongly and, you know, sinning and messing up, but to start from the place of, I need to do something. I need to try something. Um, again, you could not know anything about a soundboard and you could learn about a soundboard from messing with the knobs. And so I think that's a really good metaphor. That's for me that has comforted me um, so that I actually do something instead of get nervous and panic and, and think about it later. And I go, oh, this is going to be a good story later, you know, or whatever. Um, uh, the next I want to uh, kind of the counter of this, right, is indifference. And as Jewish people, we're very sensitive and, and hopefully very passionate about the word indifference and, uh, and, and where that comes into history. I'd like to read uh, a, a small portion from um, a collection of essays by Abraham Joshua Heschel uh, called The Insecurity of Freedom. Um, it's also in this smaller book uh, called Thunder in the Soul, a more recent compilation of little bits of readings. And this <clears throat> is something he says that I found very meaningful. There is an evil which most of us condone and are even guilty of, indifference to evil. We remain neutral, impartial, and not easily moved by the wrongs done unto other people. Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. It is more universal, more contagious, more dangerous. A silent justification it makes possible an evil erupting as an exception, becoming the rule and being in turn accepted. The prophet's great contribution to humanity was the discovery of the evil of indifference. One may be decent and sinister, pious and sinful. So I think when we think of, of, of indifference, again, it's action, which gets us away from that space. And I think in terms of understanding what mercy and justice is, we also have to understand what it's not. And indifference often feels like a neutral place to be, but it's not neutral. It's, it's, it's against. Um, and I think that's very important when I think of these things. Um, scripturally, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, it says, Children, let us not love with word or talk, but in deed and truth. Let us not love with word and talk, but in deed and truth. And of course, that strongly emphasizes action above speak, above thought. Um, not that those things are meaningless, but uh, it gives you the idea of the importance of action. And uh, lastly, for this little first section, um, I was reflecting on that I think I believe uh, that humans have a limited capacity to understand God's justice and mercy. There's, there's a limit, and I don't mean there's a limit like just wherever where you're at and you can get better. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a ceiling as to how well we can understand God's uh, mercy and his justice. And I, I think, uh, I hope I'm not using this parable too wrongly, but I think a, a good parable that kind of gets at this idea is uh, the single denarius given to each worker at the end. Because at the end he says, you know, uh, what, What's it to you if I'm if I'm generous with what's mine? Uh, you know, one translation I read was, or is your eye evil because I am good? You know, is your eye evil just because I'm good? And I think uh, with that parable, we, we see a limitation. 
And we can get concerned about that limitation by, I think that limitation is actually, um, rather than uh, something to panic over, it is an invitation to step out in faith. Uh, you know, we cannot live by a formula that does not allow for exceptions. If I say, I, every time at this exact time I do this thing, but what if something else happens that God wants you to do, you know? And I don't think we should live without formulas, without structures, but, uh, but we want to invite the spirit to allow us to be sensitive to the exceptions that we face in our day, um, the things that are hard to do that we ought to do, um, and to do that humbly out of our understanding of our ignorance to just how complex and, and holy his mercy and his justice is, um, and that we're merely stepping out in faith, trying a knob on the soundboard. On the soundboard. Um, Heschel also uh is very big on pointing to the prophet and i don't mean muhammad i mean just the all prophets that the that the role of the prophet right is is an embodiment of god's uh pathos in his in his feelings towards humans and his feelings towards justice and i just want to read a brief quote um from the same book um it says tranquility is unknown to the soul of a prophet the miseries of the world give him no rest. And uh, I'm not inviting you to, to live like that. I don't think we're all called to be prophets, but I think we are called to look at the prophets and learn from them and be sensitive to, am I, am I, am I anywhere near that, uh, that passion, that, that sensitivity to how God feels about this issue? Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there you go. All right, thanks. You done? Wrap up? Or can I say one more thing? Okay. Um, I want to conclude with a, uh, a quote from The Cross of Christ by John Stott, uh, because I think when we, when we think of the sacrifice involved in, uh, in this, uh, it's very important. So he says, to reconcile himself to us and us to himself and Jews, Gentiles, and other hostile groups to each other, costs him nothing less than the painful shame of the cross. We have no right to expect, therefore, that we shall be able to engage in conciliation work at no cost to ourselves, whether our involvement in the dispute is as the offending or offended party, or as a third party anxious to help enemies to become friends again. And so, uh, you know, people spoke of the things that we can do that are sacrificial, like, you know, financial uh, sacrifice, education, educating ourselves, educating others. And I think it's important to be a, um, a uh, more of an advocate than a representative. You know, we're not always representing all of Jewishness in every space we're in, but we are advocates for the Jewish people.